Good morning again. We are, well, actually, I'm sorry, it's, well, it's almost over. Um, <clears throat> we are thankful again for your attendance and uh, the speakers that we've had. Now we have uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Miller from Apologetics Press. He will be presenting the Apologetics Press curriculum <clears throat> and uh, what uh, he believes will uh, it will do for your Bible program, your local educational program of the local church. So uh, we appreciate uh, him and all the staff and <clears throat> administration at Apologetics Press for all the great work they have done and continue to do. And we're very pleased uh, that they consented to come and be with us. Okay, before I forget right off the bat, I've got some materials here that would be relevant to our curriculum for you here, a little flyer uh, that tells, gives kind of a bird's eye view of the curriculum as well as the Explorer series, which is part of that. I'll be talking about both of those today, and then our catalogs, some of those here and, uh, and over here. <coughs> All right, uh, just as a quick uh, look at uh, kind of some of the stats for our curriculum. We we launched this um, a few years ago. I think it was 2014 actually and now we've gotten up to we have over 3,000 uh, users for the curriculum now uh, that are located um, all over the U.S. especially down in the southeast as you might expect and we have um, oh how many <laughs> track of how many uh, countries we have using this curriculum now. I think it's 38. Yeah, 38 foreign countries are actively using it, uh, some of which you probably don't even recognize uh, the names. Uh, we're excited that there are over a thousand different uh, churches of Christ that are, that are using this throughout the world, uh, and even over 150 denominational congregations uh, that are from over 50 different specific denominations, so denominational congregations within these denominations uh, that are using this. Of course, the most uh, prominent would be the Baptist and Christian Church, Pentecostal and Assembly of God, and the non-denominational guys are the main ones that are using it outside of the church. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk more about this advanced Bible reader later on. All right, so um, statistics show that we're losing, whenever our kids leave, home, we're losing 40% of our kids they are leaving the church, 40% of them. Half of those are going into the denominational world, and the other half are becoming totally irreligious, in large part due to the teaching of naturalism in schools today. Uh, so they're losing faith in the Bible, and they believe there's not evidence to support the Christian worldview. Uh, other statistics indicate that 90% of the time, those kids who did not go to Bible class regularly at home ultimately fell away. Another way to look at that, of those who remained faithful after leaving home, 97% of those went to Bible class regularly. So that highlights the importance of our Bible classes. We're losing a large number of, of, uh, of our young people, and many times it is because they are not... Um, involved in our Bible class program and that emphasizes the importance of the Bible class even material that we're presenting it's, it is very influential it's affecting our kids uh, whether or not they stay faithful so this curriculum that, that we uh, have launched it was originally written by Rhonda Thompson uh, but then again it was 2013 actually that we launched this in February of 2013 so what is that now six years and uh, the curriculum is it's a 10-year curriculum starting with age two and going all the way through sixth grade. Age two through grade four are completely free. It's eight, eight years worth of material, all available for free online. We'll be going through and I'll show, be showing you that. The final two years, fifth and sixth grade, use our Explorer series, which we print. Uh, that's what this is on the back of this flyer. And again, those of you all that have come in, I've got materials up the front here that you can pick up. Those, um, you have to purchase who's actually print those, but the rest is actually free online. Um, one of the cool things about this curriculum is 
uh, it makes it where all of your kids from age two all the way through grade four are, are learning the same lesson during that week. Everybody's just learning it at a different level. But it helps the leadership to know what has been covered, what has not been covered by the time the kids get out of elementary school. Uh, so you know, you know, a lot of times our teachers just go in there and kind of kind of teach whatever they're ready for. There's nothing. That's, there's not necessarily a systematic approach to making sure your kids have learned everything they need to learn by the time they get through elementary and so forth. So this this is a great way to be able to do that. Uh, I even will recommend that adults, the adult classes, could actually do the same thing that the kids' classes are doing. They could be learning the same lessons they're learning that week, but just at a more advanced level. Uh, we also, the way we have it set it up, one lesson is designed for, for, to be for the week. And so uh, a lot of times the teachers will teach the material on Sunday, and then Wednesday is, is intended to be reinforcement and repetition of that material. Uh, some teachers might teach half the lesson on Sunday and then do activities to kind of reinforce that and then do the other half on Wednesday. But we believe strongly in the idea of repetition and reinforcement of the material that are being taught because uh, kids especially need a lot of reinforcement to make sure they're, they're getting this information ingrained. Now, of course, a distinction in this curriculum as compared to uh, maybe any other curriculum is number one, it's online. And number two, it is a, an open, what we call an open system. And what that means is it's we're constantly improving it, and there, we, we've developed a way for teachers to give us suggestions and feedback to let us know if there are things that might need to be adjusted or suggestions, that sort of thing. And so all of this is happening, happening constantly. Um, uh, each month I'm making hundreds of improvements to the curriculum. Each year, thousands of, of, of improvements. It's constantly improving, uh, and again, um, Another one of the one of the great things about this curriculum is is that it's not denominational. A lot of our congregations are having to use denominational material, and therefore they're having to skip over certain uh, topics and so forth because of the way it's being dealt with, or and or <clears throat> concerning. Or we all know that we've got some teachers that, that don't know the Bible as well as others, and so they may go ahead and teach some things uh, that they should be skipping over. Uh, so this, one of the great things about this curriculum is our number one goal is to make sure that it's sound in the way that we depict things, even in our coloring sheets, to make sure that we try to depict things very accurately. Now we do work in apologetics in there because Apologetics Press, that's, that's our number one thing we do, but this is not an apologetics curriculum. This is a Bible curriculum that's designed to take kids all the way through the Bible two times in eight, in eight years. And again, we'll lace in there apologetics things that are relevant uh, to make sure that our young people, number one, to make sure that our teachers are ready to deal with questions that our young people might ask. Uh, and number two, to make sure that our kids are being taught the kind of things that, that others may challenge their faith about along the way. So we work those things in there as well. All right. On the screen here, I have uh, our main website, apologeticspress.org. <clears throat> On the left side over here, you'll see our Bible class curriculum. When you click on that, it'll bring you over here, or you can go directly to apcurriculum.com. Then if you'll have a, a way to sign up here, uh, where you'll basically, it, it's free, you're just gonna be putting in, um, I think your email, maybe, uh, let's see, there may be a username, yeah, name, email, username, <coughs> have to verify that you're a real person, then you'll get an email uh, that, uh, verify that you are a real person, you'll be able to come back and then get directly into the curriculum, uh, signing in using this button. So I'm going to kind of walk you through what we've got going on in this curriculum. So uh, <clears throat> I've logged into my account here. First of all, notice we've got a search engine over here. Uh, sometimes that'll come in handy if you can't, if you want to know, okay, are we going to, are we going to end up covering this lesson uh, you know, the persistent widow. We're going to be covering that at some point. You can do a quick search. Uh, that's a great tool we have in there. You can change your password if you want to because the password that you'll be sent is weird. Uh, and so if you want to change it something more memorable, you've got an opportunity to do that. All right, over here along the left, um, if you were to go to home, it gives you kind of an intro to what the curriculum's about, um, shows you here how to use the curriculum and uh, explains this open system idea that I've really already explained to you. But we're gonna go through this more in depth now. So when you click on the curriculum, it opens up, 
grade for two year old through fourth grade, year one, two, three, and four. So you repeat this, so it ends up being eight years. It's, so it's four, four years and then another four years of doing the same thing, but at a more advanced level. And as I said before, fifth and sixth grade use our Explorer series, and you can find links to those down here. Now I'll put up notes here to kind of uh, make sure you're aware of things that are going on that you might have questions about that might confuse you. Uh, remind you about updates, for example, that um, one thing you want to be careful if our teachers go in and, and let's say you print off an entire year all at once. Um, well, if, if when you do that, you're not taking advantage of all of the edits and improvements that are constantly being made. So I usually recommend to our teachers that we just that they just print off a curriculum or a, a quarter at a time of material to make sure you're getting making use of the latest things. <laughs> Other comments here: we're using New King James version <clears throat> because that's just kind of historically been our policy at AP. For the most part, we're using New King James. Uh, here's a, an outline of 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 the four years of the curriculum gives you um, all the lessons that we cover. The way that we organize it, each year is divided into four quarters that we title. We do two quarters of Old Testament and then two quarters of New Testament to make sure that we're not doing, you know, say two full years of only Old Testament without any New Testament worked in. So we jump back and forth between Old and New Testament. Our first two quarters are Old Testament 1 and Old Testament 2, and then we do New Testament 1, New Testament 2, and then the second year we go on Old Testament 3 and 4, New Testament 3 and 4, we, keep, we do that through the four years. <clears throat> so you can see all the various, um, in this outline, it'll give you, an, uh, give you kind of a bird's eye view of all the things that we cover in the curriculum, and that'll help you to see the things that we don't cover uh, as well. All right, I'm going to jump back out of this. All right, notice now so Old Testament 1, Old Testament, where we're at is in year 1. Year 1 is divided into four quarters. It's so Old Testament 1, Old Testament 2, New Testament 1, New Testament 2. For each quarter we have uh, these buttons up here at the top. Uh, for example, if I were to click on this, <coughs> This is um, for the entire quarter. These are, you'd probably print these out, laminate them, cut them up. You can give the kids each one of them. It highlights important facts that are gonna be covered during that quarter that you really want to emphasize to the kids. You want the kids to have these things memorized. So we have those for each quarter uh, for the kids to kind of emphasize certain things. We've got review questions here. If you were to click on this, like I said, we emphasize heavily the idea of repetition. <coughs> And so each lesson in the curriculum has review questions that can be used to play games with the kids or whatever to kind of reinforce and, re and help with repetition of all the material. Each quarter then again has a separate review question uh, page. Attendance sheets are even available where you can actually, these are actually interactive where you can type in name, the name of the teacher and the class and each of the kids uh, as well. And then you print it off and you can use stars or whatever to emphasize where the kid, uh, which kids are there and so forth. All right, now I'm going to open up. So each quarter is divided into two parts. So there's roughly seven lessons in each part because you've got 13 lessons in a quarter. So when we open this up, notice first of all that this button appears entire part. So some teachers again want to um, or congregations, they may print off an entire quarter's worth of material at once and just maybe have that available by the copier. So that makes it where teachers can come in just during the quarter and copy off pages if they need to. Uh, at our congregation, most of the teachers just copy it off on their own at home, but there's that option. So this entire part button, what it does is, is it's a single file with all seven of the lessons from that part in one, so it's easier to print out. Because otherwise, when you click on each of these, they're just going to be um, one lesson at a time. <clears throat> Notice these suggestion buttons here. This makes it where teachers, if they see a typo or, or hey, you know, I thought uh, I thought we knew where Sheba was, uh, whatever, uh, they can push that button, type in the suggestion, whatever it's then emailed, we'll, we'll immediately know. Um, 
which lesson that goes with that suggestion and we can make changes real quick. So this is constantly, again, improving this curriculum. <clears throat> All right, let's see. I'm gonna go down here and let's, let's actually open up a specific lesson now. Go with this one here. So this is the eighth lesson in the first quarter. So the first sin is what we're covering. So notice that um, there's a link to the class attendance sheet within, within the actual lesson to make that easier for teachers. There's memory work for every lesson that's relevant to whatever they're learning about. Uh, songs and, and sometimes even finger plays are available. Again, trying to be very relevant to what that lesson is about. <clears throat> if they click this link, it'll actually open up a song book with um, all of the songs that, we, that we're using that, where we have permission to use the words all in one big songbook, as well as audio recordings of those songs um, sung by uh, the Singing Sycamore. Who is, uh, we've got a, a show for kids called Digger Doug, and uh, the guy, uh, Rob Baker, who, who plays uh, the Singing Sycamore, he actually sings each one of these songs. Uh, because what you'll find is uh, many, many of these songs um, the teachers won't know because some of them have literally been written for uh, that particular lesson. So there'll be new songs. And so you'll find that we have recordings of those. So when you click on one of these links, it'll take you in the lesson to where that is. Um, so like here's an example. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. I don't know what the audio is going to be. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful, little lies, what you see. Right, so oh, be careful, it. little lies, what you see. Singing Sycamore busting that out, so that's nice. <clears throat> All right. Um, moving on down to lesson visuals and teaching aids. So for each lesson, uh, we have some recommended tools that can be used. Um, uh, this is a, this is Think about this in terms of while the teachers actually... Uh, teaching, things that can be used. So, the statistics show that 25% of, of people learn um, orally, so words. You, you, can just, you can say words to them, they're going to immediately translate that and be able to learn from that way. 30% are visual learners. That means you can talk to them all you want, but they're going to tend to not pick up all of it because they need to see what you're talking about. So more of us are actually visual learners, even though a lot of times in our classes we tend to be more oral than we do visual. Uh, you've got 15% that are kinesthetic, which means you could, you could show somebody, and uh, you could tell somebody, but until they actually, they're very hands-on, until they actually do it, they're not going to get it. And then the rest are kind of a mixture. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that Jesus actually used all of these techniques himself. So whenever he would say uh, the word, you know, listen, Listen, you know, he who has ears to hear, Mark 4, 3, uh, Matthew 6, 26, he, would, he used, you know, look, look at the birds. Uh, and then, of course, he said to Thomas there in John 20, you know, feel. So it's kind of the three um, ways of, of learning. So we, we try to keep that in mind in, number one, the suggestions that we're giving in the curriculum. And number two, we try to remind teachers to be sure to think about the different ways of learning when they're preparing their lessons. So visual aids, we feel like are, are very important to try to be able to um, reach a high percentage of the kids that are going to tend to be in these classes. Um, <clears throat> another point that I want to I want to make here, one of the complaints that we've had from some of some of our really strong teachers in the Brotherhood is that some of the teachers are uh, they'll tend to just take you know say a word search or something. And the kids will end up using a large portion of their time in Bible classes doing word searches and coloring sheets instead of learning the actual material. So we, we highly uh, emphasize the importance of visuals and teaching aids to, to teach. Use most of your time in the class actually teaching instead of just giving the kids what could be busy work if you're not careful. So we have a, a Pinterest page. If you were to click this button here, this is where... Um, people, teachers have come up with, I don't even know all the terminology, I think they're boards, I think maybe they're called boards. Uh, I don't know a lot about Pinterest, but we actually have boards, I guess they're called, for every one of the quarters in the entire curriculum. 
where teachers have ideas for, have given ideas for bulletin boards and activities and so forth, uh, where teachers can, can really decorate their class visually and have, have some, some ways of teaching the material in a, in a very visual way. One disclaimer we put on that is that uh, not all pins on these boards are, are necessarily scripturally accurate, so the teachers need to be sure to modify those because some of these pins and boards that, that people have found are maybe denominational in their thinking. Um, so we haven't gone in, in other words, and edited all of the uh, boards that people send in to us, but everything in the actual lesson and in our activities uh, that we recommend has, has been very much combed over to make sure it's scripturally, scripturally accurate. <clears throat> so Pinterest is available to help with visual. There's a link to that, the Bible facts that I showed you that are at the top of each um, quarter. All right. And other, other uh, resources that can be used uh, that are relevant. Betty Lucan's felt pieces, various, uh, it's recommended to use various maps. The Abeka Flash of Cards series is a great way to visually illustrate. The problem is it's not brotherhood, so there'll tend to be uh, some inaccuracies if you um, start trying to use the lesson books instead of just using the cards. But if there's a specific card that doesn't depict something accurately, then we'll note that. We'll say, hey, skip a card, whatever. Uh, so we'll include that as well. Notice also down here in the bottom left this date, <clears throat> September 1, 2017. Back over here, you'll notice there's a revision date that's put beside each one of the lessons. So that helps you to know if the version of a lesson that you printed off is actually the latest one or whether we've actually made some improvements to it. So you check the date on your printed version. And if it's before the version that you see online, then you know you need to reprint that. So it's kind of a handy way of making sure our teachers stay on top of the latest. <coughs> Okay, personal application is available for each one of our lessons to try to make it personal for the kids. A lot of times we'll have a, have a red box for the teachers to highlight something that a lot of times may be taught wrong in that lesson that's not scriptural. So, you know, for example, our uh, teachers may, um, <clears throat> if they're not careful, they may, to, for, may tend to get depictions of angels that have wings. All right, well, every time angels are depicted in the Bible, they're always male, first of all, and they look like men. They just look like regular human men. When you talk about the cherubim and seraphim, now you've got wings, but they're not, uh, they're not the ones that came down and interacted with humans. And so we'll, have, we'll highlight something that might tend to be uh, mistaught uh, there at the beginning of the lesson to make sure our teachers are, are being more careful. All right. Um, <clears throat> Throughout the actual lesson, then, you'll find sometimes <clears throat> historical notes. This, a lot of times, is more for the teachers to have some, some background information. That we, uh, one of the things that I really like about the curriculum is our teachers are going to learn a lot from it, too, not just, not just the kids. There's going to be a lot of things that the teachers can be learning as background info to prepare them for the class that they won't necessarily present to the kids. So they're going to be learning a lot, too. Now, your older kids, they may have some questions that'll make um, some of these histor historical notes, for example, more relevant to them. A lot of times here, we'll, we'll, have, it, we'll have recommendations for, hey, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with the younger kids, you might want to skip this part or word it this way. Like, for example, when you get to Sodom and Gomorrah or David and Bathsheba, you're gonna, you're gonna have to be a little bit more delicate how you deal with that situation. So we'll give recommendations for how to teach that. Obviously, if you're dealing, if you're teaching the two-year-olds, you're not even going to do a lot of this. You're going to maybe pick out a couple of the points and emphasize that over and over and over to the kids because um, on average, the rule of thumb is however old the kid is, um, however many years he's lived, that's how many minutes that child can focus on what you're saying. It's his attention span. So if you're dealing with a two-year-old, you've got two minutes to make a point, and then he's gone. And so, so, I mean, it's, it'd be exhausting teaching two-year-olds because you've got to be jumping around in order to try to hold their attention. So you're just going to have a couple, two or three points maybe that you emphasize out of a lesson. And, but you don't have to worry because in four years they'll get the lesson again much more in depth. Notice also here we have an apologetics issue that, that maybe is relevant to the, that area of the lesson that you're talking about. 
uh, where again teachers might tend to either teach something that erroneous or you might have kids uh, that are that know hey wait a minute my friend said uh, that you know this you know how do we explain that you know maybe, so something you teach might make them question something you know and it's important that a teacher have the answer to these kind of apologetics questions especially again when you keep in mind 87 percent of the kids in America are in the public school system where the official doctrine that is taught is naturalism. <clears throat> and so no wonder naturalism is significantly on the rise in our country. So kids are being given a very one-sided view. They're being given all of the uh, arguments against the Bible to try to show the Bible's not inspired, the Bible's not from God. So our teachers in our Bible classes, you know, that's another thing. How many of our, of our parents in the church are doing their job at home <clears throat> teaching their Bible? the kids. How many of them are doing devotionals at night? I would suggest to you that that percentage is not very high, which means it's all up to our Bible teachers to make sure that they're not only teaching the material, but defending it to the kids, because that's going to be the place where they're going to get that. Uh, probably not at home, because a lot of times even our parents have questions about these things too. They haven't delved in and looked, looked at apologetics issues. They were taught naturalism. My generation and beyond was we had naturalism shoved down our throat our entire uh, school, our, our entire tenure in the school system, and so there's a lot of questions that our, that our generation has ourselves. So again, we work in relevant articles in those areas to help teachers get, get questions answered for themselves and make sure that they're ready to talk about those things with their kids if they come up. Here's another special note. You'll see these green boxes that are notes. Um, might give a little interesting insight about a particular passage. This one here about the tree of life and what that would, might have actually been like. Uh, other recommended uh, reading that's apologetics oriented. Sometimes you'll have, notice, a definition. You know, what are the cherubim? What does that mean? Uh, so we run across a term in the Bible. If the kids are reading this passage for their, on, their, on their own, they're not going to know what the cherubim are if the teacher doesn't take some time to explain that. All right, now after the lesson, we put this section called Pre-Class Activities and Learning Centers. Uh, raise your hand if you know what a learning center is. Anybody? Okay, a few people. So this is something that I don't remember seeing whenever I was a, a kid, but this is where teachers can have little, um, little areas in their classroom set up. You might have five or six different little um, centers set up where there's an activity at each one of the centers. And maybe as you're going throughout a quarter, so you got a 13, 13 week quarter break, broken into two parts. Maybe as you're going through that first part, you have a different center set up for each of those lessons, six or seven lessons. And there'll be some activity that's relevant to that lesson at each one of those places. And as kids come in for class, maybe they come in a little bit early, maybe for the first five minutes of class while you're still waiting for the stragglers to come in, the kids can immediately go to these different pods and work out the activity during that part and their goal is to try to get all those done by the end of that part so it gives them something to do they're, every minute of time that they're in the classroom is being used for something important they're not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs talking or whatever but they're learning by so these activities are recommended for that <clears throat> and as reinforcement but again not as a as a way to try to uh, where, where most of their time in the class is spent just doing these sorts of things. But this is just kind of a, a way to reinforce, uh, but not as a substitute for the teaching that needs to be going on in the class. And so again, you'll notice here it's, it's uh, divided up into uh, the age group as to what kind of activity we might have. This is a button that would open up the entire activity book for all of the activities that we've developed for that particular lesson as well as answer keys and then each one of these will take you specifically to um, each one of those activities individually jumping back over here if you were to go over here on the left to activities that's where you'll find all of those uh, separately so activities year one <coughs> and we're in uh, part two lesson eight if you were to click this It'll open up all the activities that are available for that particular lesson. Again, you can open up the entire thing or each one of the um, activities individually. You'll notice here also on the bottom left, you've got a date so that you can check and make sure you've got the latest version. But we've got 
<clears throat> we hired a guy to come in and do coloring sheets uh, for each one of the lessons in the entire curriculum, so 200 and something coloring sheets, which we're uh, gonna have in a coloring book, hopefully in the near future. And then again, various activities that are useful to help reinforce the lesson. Some crossword puzzles, word searches, sometimes there might be matching games and mazes and all kinds of stuff like that. All right. When you get down to the third and fourth graders, now you're getting to kids that have the ability to read. And so you can actually start having them read more. Now we do have, some books are, are simple enough for the first and second graders to start reading, but for the most part, in our third, when they get to third and fourth, that's where we're really, we'll put in a lot more recommendations for things the kids can read. What maybe our uh, issues of our Discovery Magazine that we put out for kids, that's our uh, Scripture and Science Magazine that we put out each month for kids. <clears throat> if there's a relevant issue um, to that lesson, we'll recommend that there. This is where we'll also recommend that the kids read, um, for example, whatever, um, let me go back to the top of the lesson, whatever the recommended scripture references are, we usually have that <coughs> listed under the third and fourth graders for the kids to go read. All right, so I'm gonna jump over to something else with that in mind. Over here on the curriculum page, down here, we have a button called Advanced Bible Reader. That's for our Advanced Bible Reader. This is another free tool that we have that can be used in conjunction with this. And this is, this is developed to try to encourage kids to do their reading, their Bible reading, and reading any other kinds of uh, materials that would be relevant, for, uh, good for them to be reading out of our AP materials at that, at that age. Um, so, for example, a kid can, um, after he signs up, you got to sign up first, but again, it's free. But I'm going to sign in here. Um, with my daughter's account. <coughs> As she's reading various passages, you'll find all of these, there's different, there's tests available that she can take. Um, I go over to Proverbs, she hasn't finished that one yet. And as she reads, for example, Proverbs seven through nine, she can go take a quiz. There's 10 questions on here that help, help to see whether she's really grasped the information that she's read. So she'll take that and it'll grade it for her. She'll get a certain number of points. It'll be added down here to her score. And as she reaches certain markers, she'll be awarded certificates. Um, she'll be given certificates here. So those are all the certificates that she's been awarded, <coughs> which look like this. Each one's designed differently for each mile, for each marker. And she can do this for, we've got tests for um, all kinds of things. So not just, we've got tests for every book of the Bible, all the Old Testament, all the New Testament, usually broken up into about five chapter chunks. But then we've also got Bible facts tests that they can take. Our other AP books that we have available, they can, they can do our monthly Christian Evidences magazine. They can take a test for those. Our Explorer series, which I'll talk about a little bit later, that's available as well. <clears throat> now, even cooler, you can sign up as a teacher yeah, let's see if I can remember what my info is. Uh, no, that's it. It's the problem with using somebody else's computer. <clears throat> So as a teacher, 
when you sign up, you'll be given a short name. In this case, P Street. I go to Panama Street here in, in Montgomery. You can change that because the, the short name they'll give you is kind of weird, so you can change that to something more that you remember. <clears throat> Each one of the kids, say at your congregation, or if you're a teacher, each one of the kids in your class, if you're an elder or a preacher and you want to do this kind of congregation-wide, you can sign up as the teacher, and then you can add each one of the students um, to kind of your group. Um, within their page, they've got a place where they can, one of these buttons allows them to change their group. If they change it to your group, now all of a sudden, you can look at all your students, which tests they've taken, uh, not just which tests they've taken, but how well they've done on. You can see, okay, what you know, what areas do I need to maybe emphasize a little bit more in my teaching? What are there areas that maybe maybe all the kids are missing the same question? Uh, that's something that'd be helpful to know. <clears throat> um, and it also keep, makes it where. The teacher can keep track of when the kids are learning or when they're reaching certain mile markers in the points they're making. So you could print out a certificate, present it to the child, make it a little bit more uh, exciting to them, give them a little bit more motivation. So I could go in here and, and look at each one of the tests that, that, uh, that the kids have taken at Panama Street, and I could you know, assess what's going on. So all right, let me, uh, let me find a good look here. Here's one of the, he's missed three on this. If I go in here and look, okay, which ones did he miss? Oh, he missed that one. How many years did the priest delay fixing the temple? Okay. All right, so you can go in here and look at exactly what they missed and, and make sure that you as a teacher can go in and, and do a little bit more work on that. All right, now back over here to this lesson. So I'm trying to keep track as I go through the curriculum making edits. <clears throat> Whenever I say, hey, uh, have the kids read Genesis 1 through 3. I'll mark that down on a paper. <clears throat> then in the next lesson, maybe they're reading Genesis 4 and 5. Okay, now I know they've read enough to go take one of these tests and get points. So then I'll recommend <clears throat> at that lesson, hey, go ahead and go print out the Genesis 1 through 5 test so that the kids can take that after they read uh, Genesis 1 through 5. So we try to, to bring in the advanced Bible reader here because, you know, what's more important than having the kids actually read the Bible? But giving them the motivation to do that using something like this is, uh, is very powerful. So as they accumulate points, they can see how, how many points other kids in the world have. You can see where, they're, uh, where they line up. <clears throat> kind of gives them a little bit more motivation. As they, uh, as they reach big mile markers, you've got the, they can get into the Hall of Fame with these other kids, including including Darth Sidious, you know, that's kind of nice. Don't you want to be in there with Darth Sidious? Are the college kids paying attention back there? I don't know. <laughs> Batman? I mean, come on, don't you want to be with Batman in the Hall of Fame? Anyway, this, this is the screen names for each of the kids. If they reach 1,500 points, they get into the Master League and then the Champions League after that. <clears throat> Right. Then in the lesson, you get down to the songs, which again, um, <clears throat> there's a, oftentimes an audio link where the teachers can go listen to the song, make sure they know um, how the melody works. We remind them at the bottom of each lesson, first of all, if there's some unknown author, a lot of times there's songs that, that probably public domain, but, you're, but we can't find for sure whether there's an author. So we, we want to make sure that we're people let us know if they know some information about that. And then we remind the teachers about about making suggestions and using the suggestion button. Wednesday evening, again, is primarily intended to be reinforcement and repetition of the materials that were taught on Sunday. And so um, there isn't necessarily usually a lot of points that are added to what was what was said on Sunday. But we'll usually have links to the review questions and Bible facts and so forth that the teachers can use on Wednesday night to kind of emphasize certain things more. All right. All right. Um, 
also along the left here, back on the main curriculum site, we have a section of maps that we've developed that again teachers can use as visual aids <clears throat> that look something like these. Again, you got to keep in mind you got a lot of kids that are very visual and it'll be helpful to have things like that. A link to our store where they can buy various some of these materials that we recommend, Advanced Bible Reader, Pinterest, activity ideas, and so forth. All right, now I wanted to show you um, our Explorer series. So once they get to fifth grade, <coughs> we recommend them using our Explorer series. This is um, eight what we call journeys. And what they would be to the teacher is eight quarters. So eight quarters of material. <coughs> so each quarter has 13 little um, little booklets, uh, 13 little booklets. So each week they would have one. And within that booklet will be three or four little articles with pictures, there's activities and so forth that are all written on a fifth and sixth grade level um, for the teacher to go through on Sunday and Wednesday with the kids. And uh, each quarter has a different, different theme and this, this doesn't really go with what the kids in age two through grade four are doing. It's a little bit more <clears throat> relevant to what we feel like kids in fifth and sixth grade need to be getting ready for as they enter into adolescence. So the first journey is all on Christian evidences, showing kids proof of the Christian worldview, <clears throat> giving, and then we go into faith building answers, talking about evidences for the flood and Babel and that sort of thing. Then they have a whole journey that's just on Jesus, learning about Jesus, who was Jesus, what were his teachings, Christian values, making sure kids uh, know the truth about alcohol and drugs and honesty and laziness and modesty and, and even things like pornography and homosexuality that are a little bit more, uh, we need to be a little bit more sensitive about, but it's dealt with on a fifth and sixth grade level. The second year they go into creation evolution, <clears throat> which helps get them ready for their life science class and their earth science classes that they'll be taking around that, that age. Journey six is probably my favorite. So in one quarter, the kids are taken through the entire Bible and they learn on about a page, about a page is devoted to every one of the books of the Bible. It tells the kids, you know, what, what is this book in a, in a bird's eye view? What is this book about? What is the, what's kind of the general outline of the book? Uh, when, when is this taking place, the material in here? Is there a thematic verse for this book, that sort of thing? Uh, very useful. Uh, so, I mean, the kids will get out of sixth grade and, and already know, you know, something about Nahum and Hosea, books that a lot of our uh, adults don't know anything about. Yet the kids will have gone through every book of the Bible and have a general idea of what it's about. Journey 7 is devoted to the church of the Bible. And then Journey 8 is another cool one kids will be learning all kinds of things <clears throat> that are will be useful to them as they study their Bible you know whenever they read across you know terms or, or certain kinds of peoples in the Bible that the Bible just mentions in passing uh, the kids won't necessarily know what those are they won't know um, about these various regions in Palestine that are mentioned various cities uh, what about the Jewish feasts and festivals they won't necessarily know about any of that this journey is devoted to kind of trying to give, a lot of, give, give the kids a lot of background about places and um, professions even, the various social and ethnic groups. Who were the Herodians and the Zealots? Who were these people? Uh, various animals that are mentioned, as well as how people dressed, how they lived, uh, how they traveled in those times. All right, so that's our Explorer series. Again, that is not free because we actually have to print that but it's, it's $10 for basically for a quarter of material for a child. So each child would be basically $10 for a quarter. Each child would get their own essentially packet of 13 lessons. The teacher wouldn't necessarily give it to them all at once. You hand them out once each, each week as the teacher's going through them. Uh, another thing that I wanted to be sure to mention to you is that um, for those of you all that are interested maybe in using the word, uh, <clears throat> the curriculum or are using it, or uh, uh, those of you all that are younger, maybe at your congregation, eventually you might, might want to use this at some point. Be aware that we do have workshops where I, I basically walk people through the curriculum like I'm doing. I go, go a little bit slower and actually answer questions from the 
teachers might have and kind of help them get signed in and so forth. Just uh, probably the biggest concern people have is we got a lot of older ladies that don't know their way around the internet. And so this is very intimidating to a lot of older ladies. And so having a workshop can help them get more comfortable and they get to hands on, do it themselves, um, where they can uh, make sure that they know how, how, to, how to use this and they're not so intimidated by it. So maybe be aware that we have that available. If you contact us, uh, we can try to, try to help you out with that. Uh, Jimmy wanted me to mention how our how our curriculum helps with gender type issues, and uh, so uh, first of all, I would I would say about gender, you know, gender. How do we even define gender? You know, today we we use things like you know you can get into genetic and chemical differences between the sexes, which can be helpful. But when you look back at the Garden of Eden. Uh, that is not how God ultimately defined gender, or at least how he, how it was, uh, how Adam was able to tell a difference in gender, right? So if you, if you think about how simple this was for Adam, uh, so he's going along, he, I mean, he, he carries out, by the way, Adam was the first biologist, and God actually instituted biology, because he parades in front of Adam all of the different species that were available at that time has Adam name these groups that's biology and Adam notices hey none of these creatures are going to work with me and so God then creates this other being and Adam looks at the being and is able to tell it's not another one of me it's not another man this is different than me so I'm going to call this woe man I'm going to call this a different name Okay, so what was it about this being that Adam saw that made it clear this is not a male? Well, she didn't have clothes on. He's looking at obvious anatomical differences that helped to distinguish what God said he made them male and female. What did he mean by that? Well, this is what he's talking about. Adam could tell that is a female because of these anatomical differences that she has. So how does our curriculum help with that? Well, we actually have a comment on that in one of our lessons there when we're talking about the first family as God designed it. When God makes uh, Adam and Eve, and then he lays out, we talk about the gender roles as God set them up, the, the different jobs that each person has in the home. And then we have a comment in there that's for teachers. They wouldn't necessarily go into this with the kids, although... <laughs> In this day and age, there's going to be more and more kids that are going to be asking some questions that teachers need to be ready to handle. We've got a note in there in one of our lessons to help teachers reason through this. And then there are links to our articles at Apologetics Press on the question of transgenderism and whether that's a biblical or even scientific idea, uh, the idea of, uh, of transgender thinking. Uh, so I think that pretty much summarizes what our curriculum does with this. So we, we, def we, uh, lay out how God defines male and female, and then the rest of the curriculum is essentially taking into account the way God set that up at the very beginning. All right, we got about what three minutes. If anybody has any questions, otherwise I am finished. Are you working for going on the creation? Oh, that's a good question. Good question. Right now, we we hired a guy that is working with um, our team material. And he's going to be doing several PBS curricula for us. And he's going to be working on a team curriculum. that will be like a 7 through 12 type curriculum. It won't be using the same material. It's going to be kind of a totally different different approach at this. But uh, uh, he's dug in on that. He's already done the first three lessons to give people kind of a taste of what that's going to be like. And it is, it's fantastic. It's, it's going to be great. And, and yet, those of us that teach know there is very little by, in the by means of uh, the, the teenage material like curricula, that's just not it's just not there. It's hard to find anything on that subject. And so we intend to have that, but it'll probably be, it'll be a little ways out when we get it. I'd be, I'd be looking within the next five years, we'll start having probably a lot more of that. Of that coming out. Any other questions? Yeah. If you're trying to get this curriculum started up, uh, the first half of the church, how would you go about that? Well, um, the way we did it at Panama Street, I, I basically somebody do what I just did. You gotta have somebody that knows how to do all this, 
which it doesn't have to be me. I mean, it can be somebody that just has taken the time to go through this. Get all the teachers there, walk them through it, show them how to do it. Uh, and once they see that, you know, then it's just, it, it helps if you have, have somebody, usually a lady that's kind of in charge of maybe the, the work room. And a lot of times she will go ahead and buy all of the recommended visuals that we recommend in here. She'll be the one to go ahead and do that. Sometimes she may be the person that goes ahead and makes copies of all of this so that it's available for the teachers. Uh, so it's helpful to have that. Uh, I always recommend in the bulletin, be sure to put in the bulletin the, the lesson that, that the teachers are supposed to be on and the one for the next week. And the reason is sometimes the teacher will get off. Sometimes the teacher might accidentally uh, do the bonus lesson. By the way, I didn't even mention, we've got 13 lessons in each quarter and sometimes we'll have a bonus lesson just in case the teacher maybe doesn't want to talk about David and Bathsheba. And so she can go ahead and jump and do the bonus lesson instead. So teachers that, that accidentally do the bonus lesson after lesson 13 are going to throw everything off and they'll be off a week. So we'll even recommend that somebody make sure that in the bulletin it's right. So you got to have somebody kind of spearhead that. Uh, but otherwise, it's just showing the teachers how this works. And once they know how to do it, uh, they can just go. It's, it's kind of self-taught. Again, I would say the number one thing here is that, that, I, that I feel most uh, impressed about this is that we have been very meticulous to try to make sure that this is scriptural. Uh, even again with the color, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't believe how much uh, effort was put into going through even like these little arch books. And well, you know, this isn't really depicted right. You need to skip this page. I mean, a lot of effort was put into that going back and redoing coloring pages because this, uh, you know, Daniel was actually really old when the lion's den occurred. So you don't draw Daniel who's young when he's thrown into the lion's den. He's a lot older. I mean, things like that, you know, trying to depict things the right way. So and that's not to say that it's perfect. You know, we, we put in a lot of time to, to make sure that this is different uh, with regard to being sound. And yet it's free, so you don't get what you pay for in this case. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> we really appreciate it. I'm glad you could be with us.